I'm Donald Leafy, president of Gulfstream Air Video Incorporated, and it's my pleasure to introduce David Patrick, senior vice president of Carl Goldberg Models Incorporated. David has won or placed in over 45 competitions, including being a member of the third place world championship team in 1989. He was a three-time winner of the Canadian Nationals, two-time winner of the Tangerine Internats. David has participated in the Tournament of Champions. He certainly is a qualified pattern flyer and knowledgeable instructor. It's a pleasure for me to give you David Patrick. Thanks, Don, for the glowing uh, introduction. The purpose of this video is to uh, improve our fellow modelers' flying skills by my proven techniques that I've developed over the years. Let's go ahead and give them a few pointers. Good. One of the interesting things about aerobatics is that even the most complicated maneuvers are based on the simple maneuvers such as the loop, the roll, the occasional spin or snap. This airplane here, the Carl Goldberg Models Eagle II, is a very popular sport training aircraft. Uh, most people probably have learnt on airplanes similar to this. It is also capable of very good loops and rolls, of course, takeoff and landings. But it does have its limitations. Uh, you wouldn't want to ask this airplane to do a, a precise eight-point roll like a more modern uh, pattern ship. Good airplane to start with. This is an airplane I designed for competition aerobatics. It's called a Conquest 5. It's designed specifically for the 22 maneuvers in F3A. and does them very well. If you want to go outside the envelope, such as a knife edge loop, it's, it will not do that very well, but for the 22 maneuvers, such as the avalanche, uh, stall turns, humpty bumps, it will do an excellent job of these maneuvers. This is the uh, Carl Goldberg Models uh, Ultimate Biplane. Powered with a YS-120 such as this one, it's capable of uh, some pretty fantastic aerobatics. While it can do all the maneuvers a pattern ship can do, maybe not quite as precise, but the maneuvers are more varied, such as it'll do a vertical snap roll or knife edge loop. If you want to go all out for the wild uh, and crazy maneuvers, this is the airplane to do it with. Is there anything different that I would need to do to the plane in preparation for flying maneuvers? Okay, um, not that much different, but you have to do it more carefully. You should go over the airplane, make sure things such as the uh, the gaps are sealed. There should be no gaps between the ailerons. Uh, sealing with ultra coat or scotch tape works fine. Your servos, uh, throttle linkages, etc., should work perfectly, flawlessly. There should be no slop whatsoever. You've got to take the extra time to make sure the airplane is balanced according to the plans, and that the airplane is balanced this way as well as this way. Bottom line, you have to take the time to make sure the airplane is set up correctly, so you don't have to fight any unwanted tendencies of the airplane to do things on its own. Okay, David, so you're telling me that it's not good enough just to have the correct gap between the trailing edge and the ailerons. You've got to further cover that with monocoat. That matters? It makes a big difference. Not only will you get a quicker roll rate or a more positive roll rate, the airplane, believe it or not, will even loop better with a totally sealed up aileron. And you shouldn't stop there. You should seal up the aileron, both of them, of course, the elevator, and the rudder. It makes quite a difference. While we're on this, the uh, balance point of an airplane is always an interesting subject. You should start out with what the plan says. Um, if you move the center of gravity forward, what you get basically is an airplane that in pitch is more stable. If you move the CG back, the airplane will become progressively less stable. If you go too far back, you'll reach a point where the airplane will become unstable. So if you're going to move the CG after what is recommended, use maybe a quarter of an ounce of it at a time until you're happy with what the results are. David, is there anything additionally that I need to do to my engine prior to flying maneuvers? Okay. There isn't a lot different except you've got to be, uh, pay more attention to the details. Uh, with a properly set up engine, you'll get more power, uh, more reliable idle, uh, and better, better control of your engine, which will again help you in your aerobatics. A uh, couple of points to note. One is, is that when you hook up the throttle, you should take a lot of time in making sure you've chosen your, a good servo, uh, there's no slop uh, whatsoever. This is particularly important when you throttle down 
This gives you a very precise idle control. Another thing is when you set up your servo uh, to the uh, throttle arm, you should follow what I call the 90 degree rule. In other words, at mid throttle, this should be 90 degrees and the throttle, the servo should be at 90 degrees as well. This takes away any differential, gives you a nice linear response. Another thing about the engine, Don, is setting up the carburetor properly. Really quite easy to do when you follow a couple of basic rules. First thing you do is you start up the engine, you go to full power and set the high speed needle to maximum power. That's easy to do. When you've got that, then richen it just a little bit, a couple of clicks maybe. With the engine continuing at full power and everything's warmed up, you pinch the line quickly. If the engine picks up RPM slightly, that's probably the optimum setting. If you pinch the line and it quickly drops down on RPM, you're a little bit lean, richen it up some more. When you think you have that right, <clears throat> and the engine again at full power, bring the nose up and listen to see if there's any RPM change. If the RPM drops, again, richen it up a little bit. That's your high speed, it's simple as that. Low speed is a tricky one. This is where most people fail. Um, you go to low power. Most two cycle engines should idle reliably between two and two and a half thousand RPM all day. Make sure you have a good plug, uh, good fuel obviously like uh, K&B, Powermaster, Cool Power. Put the engine to idle and slowly bring the power up after it's idled for let's say 20 seconds. If it stutters and chokes, it's too rich. Another way of checking that is at idle, you pinch the fuel line again. If the engine dies, it's too lean, if it dies quickly. If it slowly picks up RPM, it's probably a little bit too rich. That's how you set the low speed. Again, going back and forth and taking the time. Uh, myself, I don't even go to the flying field unless I spend an evening just making sure the engine's 100% right. Then I know I have a reliable engine, I don't have to worry about it. One of the features of the more uh, modern high performance engines is they, uh, some of them have pumps. A pump is a real nice feature. It provides nice steady fuel delivery to the carburetor, which means when you pull straight up or go down, the engine needle is always set the same. <clears throat> Very easy to set up, particularly on a YS. Consider it as the low speed needle. Uh, like when we set the low speed needle on the other engine or the other technique by pressing the fuel, fuel line, do the same thing with the pump. Put the engine to idle, you listen to it, pinch the line. If it slowly picks up RPM over a long period of time, chances are the pump is too rich, lean it out. If you press it and the engine dies rather quickly, let's say within five seconds, chances are the pump is too lean, rich in the pump. On a YS, you probably don't want to move it much more than maybe an eighth of a turn at a time. Go in slow increments. Once it's set, don't change it anymore. If you're still having problems with idle, you may have some dirt in the system or you probably need a new, new plug. David, my radio has dual rates. How would I go about setting that up? Yeah. Good question, Don. The dual rate is uh, very often uh, not very well understood. It's a very simple uh, uh, accessory or option that can really help your flying. The way to set the dual rate up is that you do most of your flying at low rate go to high rate for spin and snap roll maneuvers. And the high rate should be set up so at full stick, it will just barely do the spin and just uh, barely do the snap roll, and that's enough throw. Uh, a common mistake is having at high rate too much throw, and sometimes even at low rate too much throw. What this does to your flying is first it's hard to fly smoothly, if you're not utilizing the dual rate to its best advantage, and the system resolution, the preciseness of the radio, you lose some uh, overall system resolution. When you go to low rate, um, a quick way of uh, reference to set up the low rate, for example on ailerons, if you go to full aileron throw, you should do about three rolls in about six seconds. And that should be about right for low rate. And again, when you go to high rate, the airplane should just be able to do a spin and that's set up for high rate. Now that we have the engine set up and the airplane all nice and straight and balanced, Let's uh, sort out in our minds well, how we want this airplane trimmed out once it's flying. Some people like to trim the elevator, for example, so the airplane is diving slightly. And they have to hold a little up elevator to keep it nice and straight. I like to set the airplane up <coughs> and recommend that we trim it with the trim controls so it will fly straight and level indefinitely. Um, this uh, makes the airplane a lot easier to fly through the various maneuvers. 
Another thing that you might want to uh, touch upon is, again, on a nice calm day such as today, point the airplane into the wind and pull rather abruptly straight up and then let go of the controls. What we're checking here is if you have the correct amount of right thrust to compensate for torque. What will happen is if you don't have enough right thrust, as the airplane goes up, it will tend to wander to the left. Okay? If you want to verify that, what you do is you, again, pull the nose up after you've added a little bit of right trim. If it then goes up straight, chances are you'll need a little bit of right thrust to compensate for that. That's easily done with shims or, or uh, adjusting the engine mount. Once you've got that so you can pull straight up and you get a nice straight climb, it'll make it so much easier to pull nice round loops over the same area, square loops, uh, uh, stall turns will be a lot easier. This, this so you're not constantly fighting the torque factor. Other than that, you're ready to go fly. Uh, we're going to do a couple of uh, <coughs> basic maneuvers when we go flying this afternoon. Basically, we're going to do a loop, a roll, and a few spins, and maybe a snap roll or two. What's interesting about, again, like I mentioned before, even the most complex maneuvers are based on a loop and a roll, or a, se a segment of each maneuver. Square loop with half rolls, that's a K5 maneuver, a very difficult maneuver uh, according to the FAI schedule. All it is is four quarter loops and four half rolls in sequence. Again, what I'm trying to say is that you look at a complicated maneuver, you can reduce it to doing simple loops and simple rolls, and you're done. Let's go fly. Good. Yes. Here we go. Full power, keeping it straight with the rudder. Little elevator, nice rotation. There we go. Okay, let's watch this again in slow motion. Slowly apply power. Use the rudder to keep the airplane straight. You'll probably favor right rudder as your airspeed builds up. Little up elevator to rotate. Not too much. Nice, smooth takeoff, keeping the wings level. Easy. Yeah, David, how, how steep do you make that first turn? I like to keep that turn uh, about 30 degrees. Not much more. And I guess always away from the from the pits, huh? Yep, always. Let's watch this again. Boy, look how long you keep the rudder in. Yep. I like to keep the rudder maybe up towards 50 feet of altitude. Again, until the airspeed builds up, you do need a little rudder to keep the airplane straight, even in flight. This right here, this shows the biggest difference. That, that nice, long, smooth, scale-like takeoff. Be smooth on the controls, and it'll look good. Okay, let's go on to landings. The key to a good landing is a good approach with the right airspeed. There's a nice one. Let's watch it again with another airplane. Nice approach. Try to keep the wings level. The airplanes throttle all the way back. A little crosswind. Slower and slower. Okay, again, we try to keep the wings level all the way down to touchdown. And when, you, when the wheels touch, try to have full up elevator. This takes all the fly out of the airplane so it won't bounce back up in the air. When you have a full stall landing like we just had, as soon as the airplane starts rolling, take the elevator out. So there's no chance of it bouncing up in the air. Let's watch it again. We've got the throttle all the way back, trying to keep the wings level. Notice we have a little bit of up elevator because we're slowing down. A little more up elevator. The transition of flight to landing is a progressive amount of up elevator till touchdown. See, full up elevator is being held here. Beautiful. This is, this is one of the things that you have to practice. Every airplane is different, but the result is the same. You're slowly applying elevator and rotating the airplane so you touch on the main wheels, full stall. Good landing. Practice and practice and practice. So flying circuits and touch and goes would be of help. It's a great help. Even though uh, I'm a competitor and I shouldn't know how to do a good landing, I get out there and I practice circuits, circuits and bumps with regularity. Beautiful.
Let's go on to uh, practicing straight flight. Really important practice. It may seem kind of boring, but it's important to teach yourself to fly the same line, whatever that line you established, let's say it's 100 feet out, up and down the runway. You'll notice that uh, as you become more proficient, you may not see much movement in the airplane, but there's subtle movements in the sticks to make the flight look smooth and straight. Okay, let's look at a basic turnaround maneuver called a split S. This one here is a variant called a Humpty Bump. The result's the same. You can turn around the airplane and bring it back at the same altitude and the same line that you went out with. Okay, let's watch it again. This is the split S, 45 degrees. Half roll, pull up elevator, throttle back about here, and you're on back on the same line. Let's watch it. Pull up, hesitate, roll, hesitate, pull up elevator, come around. About here you start to throttle back. This is so you don't have excessive speed at the bottom of the loop and the airplane won't balloon. You'll end up being at cruising speed going by without any trim changes. Let's watch it again. Fairly easy maneuver to do, it just requires some practice to uh, get the timing down. Use the split S at each end of your straight flight practice to tie it all together. Let's do the procedure turn. Another way of turning the airplane around to come back on the same line is the procedure turn. Here we're doing a right 90 degrees followed by a left 270 degree turn to come back down the same line. The beauty of this maneuver is that since you're not climbing, you're ending up at the same altitude and since you're not diving, you're not changing the speed. Let's watch it again. It's also good practice because it gives you a, a couple of interesting angles to look at the airplane. Good practice is to do a procedure turn like we are here, a right, then a left 270. Do your straight flight from left to right and do another procedure turn going the other way, which would be a left 90 followed by a right 270. This gives you a real good look at the airplane at all different angles. You'll find also that when you practice this, that when you do it from the left like we are now, when you go to the right, you'll have to almost relearn the maneuver. Now let's go on to the uh, axial roll. There's the conquest, now the ultimate, now the eagle trainer, which is quite capable of doing a pretty good roll. To enter it, I recommend that uh, full speed Nose up a little bit, full aileron. When she's upside down, you might want to give a little bit of down elevator, then release. There we go, there's the down, and release. Let's work on the loop. Again, smoothness is the key. A lot of people, when they do their first loops, tend to just haul on full up elevator and do a tight loop. What you really gotta do is do it nice and smooth. Nice and gentle. There we go, we start to pull up. You may need a little right rudder, like here. Again, to keep the, the airplane going straight up. Coming down the back side loop, start throttling back. I can't get over how big that loop is, David. Let's watch 
watch it one more time. A little right rudder to keep it straight. Over the top, stretch the top so it's nice and round. Throttle back so we don't have too much speed on the bottom. Keep those wings level and smooth out. Nice loop. Now, if you don't have the power, like this airplane will have, like a, an Eagle or a basic trainer, you might not want to do it as large. But power will dictate the size of the loop and speed. Let's try some straight inverted flight. Here it is with the Conquest. Nice rollout, wings level. The ultimate, we'll bring it down a little bit to show it off. And now with the Eagle too. Pull the nose up a little bit as she rolls inverted. And here we are with the split screen. You'll notice that I use a little bit of elevator to roll into the inverted position. And when I'm rolling out, I use what we call top rudder. Watch the right rudder when I roll. Okay. This holds the nose up to make a nice clean roll. The reason why we do it this way, only adding the uh, rudder on the exit, is because on a trainer like this, it starts to slow down. In a pattern ship, we would use the rudder going in and out. Now for the stall turn. This is a, more of a timing maneuver than anything else. And uh, the right application of power. Many people, when they do a stall turn, they tend to uh, throttle all the way back and then just hammer the uh, rudder across. While sometimes that's, it'll work, it's more of a chance maneuver. Let's go into detail how to do a nice stall turn. Okay, here we go. Pull straight up. Now for illustration, I'm doing a quarter roll so you can see the airplane better. Throttle back, but not all the way back. I have probably about 20% power. Slowly add rudder, and then have full rudder. Like right there. Now throttle all the way back. Hold the rudder in, and slowly remove the rudder after you finish the stall turn. This stops the tail from wag wagging on the way down. Watch this again in real time. Up, throttle back, a little bit of rudder. Now full rudder to get it across. Hold that rudder in for a little bit. And recover. That's the proper technique. Did they take points off, David, for the tail wagging up at the top of that when you're coming out? In competition, yeah. It's rather a severe downgrade. That's why we hold the rudder. See it's being held here and slowly removed. There. Done. Nice. Now for one of my favorite maneuvers, the good old spin. Death-defying spin. What we're doing here is a three-turn spin. We're going to do a three-turn spin every time to illustrate. Entry is very important. You've got to have a full stall. See how the nose dropped? then she's ready to spin, not before. If you try to spin before then, the airplane will do somewhat of a snap roll. Let's watch it in slow motion. Hold the nose up, more elevator, up elevator, up elevator, then the nose will drop. Only then do you start spinning. There. Now you get full up elevator, full here right aileron, a full right rudder, and she's spinning. Just before the end of the third one, you let go. She recovers instantly. Back to level flight. You can spin in either direction. I tend to uh, spin to the right. Again, you must wait for the nose to drop. Then the airplane's fully stalled and ready to spin. There's the drop. Full controls. And recover. There's another good turnaround maneuver. Half loop, half roll. Here we go. Let's watch it again. Here you do your half loop, like we talked about the loop before. A little right rudder is required here to keep the airplane straight. Now since I roll right, I keep the right rudder in, 
to hold the nose up as we roll to upright. And she comes out nice and straight. If you were to roll left, you'd have to use left rudder to keep the nose up. Since you roll right, it's a lot easier. Getting back to what we talked about, all maneuvers are basically loops and rolls. Here's a combination. Half loop, half roll. David, what a great day. This has really been a lot of fun. I've learned a whole lot, too. Oh, good. Really glad you enjoyed it. A couple of points. Uh, don't practice too hard. Uh, three or four flights a day is plenty. Enjoy flying, and uh, look forward to the uh, next video on how to do more advanced aerobatics. Great. Thank you a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Leafy with Gulfstream. It pleases me to welcome all of you to Ring It Out Volume 2. Even more advanced aerobatics. We're filming today at a new facility. We're about 15 miles outside of Athens, Georgia at Taylor Jenkins Airstrip. Taylor is quite an interesting fellow. Besides being a full-scale pilot, he's quite an accomplished modeler. 
Taylor, thank you for uh, allowing us to come out here and use your facility. Thank These you planes are, uh, are gorgeous. You mind telling us a little bit about them? Okay, the, the P-38 here is kitted by CBA models up in Warren, Ohio. I did the fiberglass molds for them, built them some dozen or so booms that go with the kits. It has a 10-foot wingspan, retractable landing gear. It will take uh, two 4.2 SAX engines and some six to eight servos to operate it. It's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Thank you. What about this P-26? The P-26 has always been one of my favorites. This is a quarter-scale model here, 84-inch wingspan. I'm working on a third-scale model now that I plan to kit myself. Should have it out in about a year. Well, we'll all be looking forward to that. Taylor, once again, thank you so much for okay. allowing us to be out here. I think everybody would like us to go on and get to the part where David okay. comes on and teaches us more. Hi, Don. It's good to be back. From the uh, first videotape, we talked about the basic building blocks of maneuvers. Uh, we learned that the most sophisticated maneuver was essentially built up from the basic loop, roll, snap, or spin. In this video, we're going to talk about more precise flying, taking these uh, basic loop and rolls and uh, learning to put them where they need to be, how to practice, etc. Uh, we'll also learn that a well-disciplined precision flyer will be better able to tackle the more advanced hot dog flying, which we'll talk about in video number three. Don, before we get into the uh, nitty-gritty, we're going to assume that uh, we have a good aerobatic airplane, such as an extra ultimate a good pattern ship such as the Conquest, an airplane capable of doing the, aer the aerobatics that you want to end up doing. Also that you have it adjusted vis-a-vis uh, -vis the throws, the gap sealing engine, etc., such as uh, what we talked about in the first tape. Uh, with that in mind, then we can move on and, and uh, start doing the more advanced aerobatics. Good, let's get started. David, I've noticed some planes with a tune pipe and some without. Is there an advantage to having a tune pipe? Yes, there is. Uh, the main two advantages are, uh, first, you get more power. And it's a quieter setup as well, generally quieter than a conventional muffler. To do aerobatics, you don't need the extra power, but it's nice, particular in vertical maneuvers. As for setup, uh, we'll talk about quickly on how, if you don't have any numbers from the engine manufacturer or you're starting from scratch, start with a full header full length, run the engine, and tack it carefully. Cut off maybe a quarter of an inch of the header, tack it again. If you notice an increase of RPM, keep on knocking off a quarter inch off the header until you stop noticing a gain of RPM. Stop there, that's probably pretty close to being right. As for the uh, YS long stroke, which we're using here, and the Hattori 650 pipe, which is a very popular pipe in the, in the pattern circles, we like to use a 7-inch header, or it's about 14 inches from the glow plug to the screw. And if you're not using a Hattori pipe, use about 16 inches from the glow plug uh, to the uh, high point, or where the bend stops, right here. This is a good starting point on the setup. Bear in mind, we're using a 1211 or a 1212 prop and about 20% nitro fuel. This setup works very nicely. David, in Ring It Out Volume 1, you went over tuning up two-stroke engines. I'm noticing a lot of four-strokes being used. Can you give us some tips about that? Sure. The uh, four-stroke engine does take a little different technique. Uh, the modern four-stroke is really a terrific engine. Lots of power, smooth running, and becoming quite the choice on aerobatic flyers. The four-stroke uh, requires, in general, a much richer setting than what we're used to with the two-stroke. In fact, uh, what we talked about is pinching the line and noticing what happens to the RPM on, on a two-stroke. That's not what we want to do on a four-stroke. What we want to do is set it up quite rich, slowly lean it out to notice maximum power or near, near it and maybe richen it up a bit. Unlike a two-stroke, a four-stroke will deliver 95% uh, of its power at a very rich setting. As for fuel, um, it's pretty important to use a good quality fuel. Uh, four-stroke is a busy engine, has a lot of parts. Uh, there's some debate on two-stroke and four-stroke fuel. I would recommend using a two-stroke fuel in a four-stroke, primarily because it has uh, additional oil. Uh, one of the things that uh, more recently we're doing is we're adding nitro to get more power to the four-stroke. Uh, while it's not necessary, these engines will run very nice on 10% fuel. Uh, some people have gone as far as running 40% and 50% nitro. 
and getting a tremendous amount of power, and they seem to be holding up quite nicely. When you're running a 10% fuel, as for a prop, you probably want to run around a 14.10. 20% nitro, you probably want to go to a 14.5, 12 or so. 50% nitro, 40, or 40%, you probably want to go as high as 15.12 propeller. Uh, we've been running a 15.12 on 40% and turning in the order of 8,500 RPM. Generally, that's a good RPM range, regardless of nitro and prop. Uh, try to get your, for example, a YS around 8,500 to 9,500 RPM. No, no higher than that. It's very, very hard on the engine. David, can you take some of the mystery out of prop selection for me? How do you tell when you're overpropped? How do you tell when you're underpropped? Sure. Basically, it's RPM related. If you're underpropped, your engine will over rev. If you're overpropped, it'll under rev or be overloaded. It's like selecting the right gear in your car when you're driving. You should start off by using the prop that the engine manufacturer recommends. For example, let's say uh, we've selected a 60 to use in a biplane, and the engine manufacturer recommends a 1211. We know that the biplane is going to have more drag and it'll require probably more thrust. So we'll probably say, well, let's go up in diameter to get more thrust. What should the pitch be? Well, you take the 12 times 11, that'll give you 132. That is uh, what I would call a prop loading factor. You take your new diameter, which is 13 inch, divide it into the 132, and that'll give you 10. So your prop now should be a 1310, and that should work quite nicely. Okay, well, what about three blade versus two blade? Uh, the three bladed prop um, will offer more ground clearance and is aesthetically uh, a neat propeller to use in certain instances. But for ultimate and performance, stick to the two-blader prop. That's a more efficient uh, design. Good. Dave, it seems that soft mounts are being used more and more in this hobby. You see them everywhere. Is there a true advantage to using soft mounts? Sure is. Uh, three significant advantages. One is it's a quieter setup, less noise. The other is that uh, since you're not transmitting the vibration directly to the uh, airframe, you can build a lighter airframe, make your airplane lighter for the same amount of power. And uh, thirdly, it's easy on the radio, since you're not, again, not transmitting that vibration directly to the radio. Uh, in the old days, it was not uncommon for us to service our radios, particularly the servos, every 100 flights or so. Now it's not uncommon to go three or 400 flights between having to service the uh, servos or exchange the servos. This mount's a two-stroke mount. What about mounting uh, soft mounts on a four-stroke? Right. It does take a little bit different of a setup because the tremendous amount of vibration a four-stroke has. I know that Sullivan is working on one and it's about to be released. Gator has one which some competitors are using quite successfully. Uh, I would recommend uh, soft mounting a four-stroke if you can find a good soft mount for it. David, with the advent of programmable and computer radios, are they necessary for good aerobatic flight? No, they're not necessary, but it, uh, it sure helps. For example, uh, most aerobatic airplanes, or any airplane for that matter, have some coupling of controls in one form or another. In other words, if I fly along and I apply rudder, some, most airplanes give you more than just the rudder command. For example, uh, if you give left rudder, most airplanes tend to roll left as well. Well, if you're trying to sustain knife edge and you apply left rudder, you don't want the airplane on its own to want to roll out. So what we do with a modern uh, computer radio, we can mix opposite aileron, so when you apply rudder, it gives a little bit of opposite aileron to compensate for that. That gives you a truly neutral airplane, and that's easier to fly good aerobatics with that kind of setup. A couple of points to, uh, to note, when you apply uh, mix, for that type of fix, uh, only one, two, or three percent is generally enough. Uh, in other words, when you first try to add a opposite aileron mix or something like that, don't give 20 percent, you may end up really messing up your airplane and risking the airplane. Add only a couple of percent and build from that. Some of the features of the programmable radio are, you can have uh, exponential on one channel, variable trace ratio, or VTR on another, and dual rate on a third. Like we have on our extra 300, I have dual rate on rudder control, which we're familiar with, exponential on elevator, which softens the throw around neutral for smooth flight, yet gives me full control at the uh, a limit, 
and uh, variable trace ratio, which is similar to Expo, but instead of being a curved change, it's more of a straight line with a quick change up to the high point. We have that on ailerons. How we set that up is on Expo, a good place to start is around 30%. 30, maybe as high as 40. Work your way up till you get the feel that you like. Uh, you know when you're wrong if it's too sensitive around neutral and it's difficult to maintain smooth flight or if you have to move the stick too much to get some change. Uh, that's the either extreme. And that's the same with the uh, VTR. VTR, however, takes two adjustments. You have where uh, you want that bend to be, where it catches up, and how uh, low that first slope is. That first slope is adjusted by the dual rate function. For example, a good place to start there is around 70%, which is already set up on a Fataba. The bend on where it catches up, I like to set it up at 100%. In other words, it only catches up when you move the stick all the way. <clears throat> Some people have it start earlier, but that's, uh, again, it's personal choice. These functions uh, really, again, are not necessary, but it helps on making uh, you a better pilot more easily. David, are there any other neat tricks you can do with the programmable radios? Yeah, there sure are. Uh, one is, is that you can put more than one airplane in a transmitter. For example, the nine-channel Fataba will hold, I believe, six airplanes. What that means is, is all the adjustments, some like we talked about, the expo, reversing, etc. After we got this all set up, it goes into memory, and I can do another airplane entirely different uh, with all the adjustments and call upon that. So I can have one transmitter for more than one airplane. Something else you can do with that feature. So let's say on airplane A, I have the extra 300, and I have some ideas. I want to try some changes. I can load airplane A into B by copy function. Make the adjustments. If I don't like it, I simply go back to A and continue on. If I like what I did to the airplane in B, load B into A, and now I have the airplane with the new adjustments. Nice feature. Some people have gone so far as uh, have airplane A on their extra, for example, for a windy day. On a calm day, they go into uh, the B setup. Another thing is that uh, there's endpoint adjustments. They call it uh, ATV. ATV, right. Uh, sometimes that's misused. I like to bring that up. Uh, for example, let's say your ailerons are too sensitive. Uh, what you don't want to do is dial it out through the ATV. The ATV is strictly for fine-tuning. In other words, get the airplane as close as you can mechanically by arms on the servo and on the elevator, and then fine-tune to get exactly the deflection you want on the uh, ATV function. David, what is the differences between FM and PCM? Well, uh, there are significant differences. One thing to note is that PCM is transmitted on FM. What it really comes down to is they glitch differently. If there's interference, they handle interference a little differently. An FM, if you get some interference, you'll notice it uh, I immediately. It'll, it'll start, uh, surfaces will start to jitter. With a PCM, it's a computer sent signal with a computer on the airplane looking at the data. When the data gets uh, garbled or there's interference, the error count goes up. And it, when it goes up to a certain level, then the radio makes a decision whether to continue listening or to either go into hold or into a program uh, failsafe, which you can program into PCM. Uh, is there an advantage? There probably is a slight advantage to PCM. The bottom line is, is they glitch or handle interference differently. But a good FM radio can be used for aerobatics just as well. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the airplanes we're going to use today is the Carl Goberg Models Ultimate 10-300. Very popular kit. We're using a YS120, a Fataba radio, and it's an excellent aerobatic airplane, particularly for uh, hot dog maneuvers, which we're going to show later on the tape. Another airplane we're going to use today is a Carl Goldberg Extra 300. Like the uh, Ultimate, it's very similar scale aerobatic airplane. Uh, while I can't do all the hot dog maneuvers, it's very precise, excellent flying airplane. Again, we're going to be flying it with the uh, YS120 and the Fataba radio. This is the uh, Conquest 7, the latest in a series of pattern competition uh, planes that I designed. We're using a uh, Fataba radio and a YS long stroke engine. This airplane, while it's designed uh, specifically for competition aerobatics and the 22 maneuvers, is not particularly well suited for hot dog flying, but very well suited for uh, precision aerobatics. 
Okay, Don, now that we have the uh, computer radio set up and the engines tuned in and uh, the hardware all taken care of, the most important thing about aerobatic, or I should say precision aerobatic flying, is the precision part. Lines, symmetry, etc. And once you get that down pat, you have to learn how to do that in different wind conditions. Uh, this is really what precision flying is all about. Uh, getting full control of the airplane under various conditions, putting it exactly where you want. Once you've mastered that, that makes the uh, hot dog or hot dogging even easier, which we'll talk about in uh, video number three. Anyway, now that we're ready to go, let's go fly. David, when you're first learning knife edge, is it helpful to always roll in the same direction? Yeah, when you're learning any maneuver, you should uh, work on the same direction. Uh, roll should be the same way. Uh, if you prefer right to left, practice from right to left until you become proficient, then you can work on the other direction. Our first maneuver here is a knife edge. Uh, the first two shots were a little low. When you're learning how to fly, you want to start a little higher. Roll the 90 degrees. Add uh, enough rudder to keep the nose up. And roll out. This is a really good practice maneuver to become proficient with how to hold the nose up while you're in knife edge. Very nice. Try to visualize the maneuver in your mind before you uh, you go on. Now we're on to the slow roll. The first part's just like the knife edge, but now we're going to continue and go all the way around. Left rudder to hold the nose, little down elevator, little right rudder, and we finish. In slow motion, this gives us a, an opportunity to look at the inputs. Little left rudder here, down elevator goes in, in goes the right rudder, and we finish it. In real time, slow roll should take about four to six seconds. Very smooth. Okay, another variation of the slow roll. We stop at every 90 degrees, we call it a four point roll. First point, just like the knife edge that you learned first, like so. Little down elevator, little right rudder, and we finish. Just like the slow roll, the left rudder, little down elevator. The only difference is that we're stopping the ailerons at every 90 degrees. There's a rhythm to the mm -hmm. sticks, isn't there, David? Mm -hmm. It's a timing maneuver. Visualizing what you were going to do before you did it, obviously, would be of help. You should have a pretty clear picture of what the maneuver looks like in your mind and what you have to do before you try it. That's what makes this tape so helpful. Yeah. Eight-point roll. Again, like the slow roll and the four-point, except now we're stopping at every 45 degrees. And again, it should take about four to six seconds to complete the maneuver. Is there control input for those extra clicks? Just like the slow roll, uh, the only difference is that we're stopping uh, every 45 degrees. You notice that we have the rudder and the now little down elevator. Little right rudder goes in, more right rudder, and remove the right rudder in the last one. Here's an opportunity to learn a fine point of an eight point roll. On the upright portions of the 45 degrees, point one and seven, add just a touch of up elevator. This helps reduce loss of heading during the maneuver. Well, that was fun. Let's take a break at this point to talk about uh, practice, how much to practice, etc. cetera. Uh, burning lots of fuel isn't always productive. Uh, I like to practice probably about three, maybe four flights in an afternoon, no more. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain concentration beyond that. The other thing is, is try to set goals, and uh, short-term goals and long-term goals. Uh, long-term meaning, at the end of this summer, I'd like to be able to be at this level of proficiency. Uh, short-term meaning, today I'm going to perfect my four-point rolls. I've been having some difficulty. Or today I will start to learn a new maneuver and learn it by the end of two weeks. Planning and setting goals really helps in improving your flying and building on your flying skills. Lots of fun. Let's go back flying. Good. 
Okay, now we're going to work on looping maneuvers. The outside loop takes a half a slow roll to enter. And we push a little down elevator to go around the top. Good time to throttle back. And we do the other half of the slow roll to finish. There you go. Let's try the same thing with the extra. To make the maneuver look like, or the loop, look nice and round with the same speed, throttle management's pretty important. Okay, with the extra, now we give full power. Okay, we push. You'll notice that we have a little left rudder. Typically when you push for an outside maneuver, left rudder input is needed. It's all back so we don't build up too much airspeed. And we exit or do the other half of the slow roll. Right aileron and right rudder. There we go. Let's watch it in real time. Half a slow roll. Full power. Push. A little left rudder to keep it straight. Throttle back to keep the airspeed the same, constant. And roll right, slowly, the right rudder. You can see where, if you've learned to do your slow rolls in one direction, how they become helpful. Uh, everything just builds on everything else. Right. It's really a good system, David. And again, to remind you, uh, mo almost all aerobatics is a combination of a loop and a roll. Here goes a half a loop with a half roll on top. And we push to a half outside loop with a half roll. The uh, rolls are not slow rolls here. Uh, if we were to do a slow roll and double in it would take too much airspace. So we tend to do a, a quicker roll on top and on the bottom. Another thing, these rolls should be done immediately after the loop portions. Remove the elevator and roll right away. A pointer to help uh, you through this maneuver, if you've been rolling right, which is the direction I prefer to roll, typically in the double eye you'll need a little right rudder like we have here. Now since we roll right, that's the correct rudder input to hold the nose up for that for, for that roll. So roll right, right rudder. Throttle back so we don't have too much extra speed. Is there small rudder input on the downside of that, David? Uh, that's something you have to observe. Again, we roll right to upright, and we had right rudder to hold the nose up. If you don't apply the rudder, the nose will drop, both the top upper roll and the bottom roll. That's something you definitely want to have together before you... Right. Keep. But see, if you've learned how to do the slow roll, and you learn how to do outside loops, inside loops, this again is a building block. If your purpose was in advancing so that you could do hot dog or more advanced maneuvers, things scary and close to the ground and all, being able to control the nose, obviously is something you have to have together. Mm -hmm. You want to practice that up high. Well, you can see how these pattern maneuvers really can build proficiency on rudder and throttle. Uh, okay, we're into the Cuban 8. Again, it's, uh, I believe, five-eighths of a loop with a, uh, a half roll. A couple of key points here. Those loops have to be the same size. The 
rolls have to intersect. Okay, now we're pulling. Keep those wings parallel to the ground, correct with the rudder. Now we roll. We like to roll halfway on the straight portion. Mentally, in your mind, if you remember where that spot was, then you fly to hit that intersect point. Yep, that was at the same cloud. <laughs> now let's watch this in slow motion. Okay, up we go. If you remember, generally when you pull for an inside loop like this one is here, you generally need a little right rudder. Now, of course, this will depend on wind, and mm -hmm. if you started with the wing low, that's, that's something else, but generally need a little right rudder. We throttle back, halfway through the straight portion, we're gonna roll. We thro again, throttle management is to keep the airspeed as constant as possible. Little right rudder. Again, we're doing an inside loop. Throttle back. Because you're coming down, you don't want to go too fast. Like your slow roll, I sometimes add a little top rudder on the, on the downward roll to make it look a little more axial. Okay, we'll watch this again in real time. If you're being judged, they're going to look at two things. They're going to look at the size of those two loops, if they're the same size, and they're going to look, they love to watch that intersect point. Many times you see a judge put his hand up to remember where that space was. And it's good practice. You're getting some looping experience, and you're getting uh, rolls thrown in at the same time, and in two different directions in one maneuver. David, as long as it takes to complete this maneuver, and as much sky as you use up, if there was much of a crosswind, that really could uh, play havoc with that maneuver, couldn't it? Right. Any maneuver that has a lot of hang time, or a lot of exposure time, if there is wind pushing you in or out, it's going to have a, quite an effect on your position. Uh, the easiest thing to do when you're learning how to compensate for a crosswind is when you enter that maneuver, if the wind, for example, is pushing you in, keep the nose out. If you have the nose out correctly, or the correct amount, before you enter and maintain that position of the nose throughout the maneuver, you'll have it knocked. Here we go into a snap roll. Got it. Beautiful. Basically, a snap roll is a high speed horizontal spin with full power, full elevator, full rudder, full, full aileron. Here we go. You'll notice that I remove rudder a little bit before I remove the aileron and elevator input. This is to reduce the heading loss. Here we go. Nicely done. The ultimate does a fine, fine snap roll. Okay, here is an avalanche that is a regular inside loop with a snap roll on top. Okay, we're gonna watch the extra do it. Nice round loop. Just before you reach the top, you snap. That's so you're snapping through the center portion of the, or the center top of the, of, the, uh, of the loop. I like to uh, snap with full power. I think it snaps a little bit more authority. Another thing I like to do is to take the elevator out of the loop just before I snap. This helps prevent chopping off the uh, top of the loop. Okay, here we go at full power. See the F elevator we have to to fly through the loop. I'm reducing the elevator. We'll touch it down, snap, and release. A cleanly done avalanche is really a, a pretty maneuver to watch. It's gorgeous. 
Okay, you notice how we throttle back, try to keep the RCP as constant as possible. Another reason I like to keep full power in the avalanche is uh, through the snapping part is so I don't lose so much speed at the top of the loop. Okay, remember just before, a little bit of down, real quickly, and snap. Down we go. I've long thought it unfortunate that uh, that video tends not to be able to show the majesty of these maneuvers. If people were out there and could see uh, see you do these, these things are monstrously tall. We try to show mm -hmm. clouds when we can to, to see how big they are, but uh, they're unbelievably tall and majestic. A lot of power helps here. Uh, I do not use a snap button. A lot of people do. Uh, I prefer to fly these snaps by hand. Another variation of the uh, of the loop is a square loop. Not quite as simple as it sounds. There's a lot of places it can go wrong because of the change of airspeed. A um, couple of points to work on. Try to keep the radiuses the same on all four. It's difficult to do because the top corners are done at a much lower airspeed. So a common error is getting four different radiuses. The biggest radius typically is the last one, this one here. And another mistake is uh, not having all four sides the same length. It's a good maneuver to work on your proficiency. Notice we have a little right rudder as we cross uh, that top corner. Remember when I tell you, whenever you pull, you mm -hmm. typically need a little right rudder. Mm -hmm. See a little right rudder as we're pulling around here? Very subtle. David, does it matter whether these maneuvers are entered, entered upwind or downwind? Virtually all man looping maneuvers should be done upwind, and all rolling maneuvers should be downwind. Okay. Here we go in real time. Again, throttle back to keep the uh, airspeed constant. While this is an F3A maneuver, a competition maneuver, uh, even for hot dogging, if you bring that low and close, it's an impressive maneuver mm -hmm. to watch. What a beautiful day for flying. Remember, practice does make perfect, yet don't over-practice. Uh, what we've done in this tape at the end here, you'll see that we've taken the maneuvers that we learned today and strung them together, uh, which is actually part of the FAI schedule for a competition. Uh, now that we got your proficiency up to a very high level, you'll be ready for our next tape, which is hot dog flying. Look forward to seeing you there. Can't wait. Thank you, David. Take care. Okay, here we've tied these maneuvers together. The first maneuver is a half reverse cubinate, like the cubinate we did before, but we pull and do the half roll first. Now we're going to the half, or should do the five eighths of a loop. Pull the way up, half roll. This half roll should intersect. And we complete. Now we're going to go into a stall turn with half rolls up and down. Half roll should be in the middle. Nicely done. Hold the rudder in so the tail doesn't lag. Yeah. Tape number one. Now we go into a slow roll. Now we go into a half square with a half roll. That's the top part of the square. Throttle way back, pushing those down 45 degrees. Snap roll. All things that we've learned. All the things that we've learned. We've Everything you ever wanted to know is in those maneuvers. That's great.